the most important thing would be that um, we now understand that complex systems, ecosystems, but also other complex systems like the brain or, or even financial markets have uh, tipping points, which is uh, like something that everybody can understand. A chair has a tipping point. If you push it too far, uh, you get into the situation that even a slight perturbation can create a situation where you get self-amplifying change and you end up in a very different situation. So in the, in the case of uh, lakes that we've been uh, studying originally, there is the, the switch that you can have between clear water and turbid water. Once it becomes turbid, it's very difficult to make it clear again. When, when you think of uh, financial markets, you can think of uh, the big collapse of financial markets that we have uh, seen. And when you think of the brain, for instance, you can think of the, the onset of a migraine attack or an epileptic seizure. So those are situations when for a very long time the complex system seems to be behaving perfectly well and suddenly it radically changes. The interesting thing is that you can use this information. You can use this information about tipping points in uh, two different ways. One is um, if a system has passed a tipping point and it is in a situation that you don't like, um, you can understand uh, how you can restore the preferred situation and sometimes that needs shock therapy. For instance, for the lakes, we found that they become turbid because of a, a gradual accumulation of, uh, of pollution, of uh, nutrients. Um, but reducing the nutrients is often not enough to restore the lake. You need uh, shock therapy. And the shock therapy, in this case, is temporarily getting fish out of a lake. Then it becomes clear, and once it is clear, it remains clear. So that is a shock therapy restoration. Uh, it, in a way, it is similar to the poverty trap in humans. The poverty trap is a state that you don't want to be in. You have no resources to, to build a life, to get an, an education, to buy some things, to, to start a, a business. And you need a shock therapy to get out. And the shock therapy that works often quite well is um, the microcredit. Uh, you, you add something to the system and if you're successful, um, a family can build up a small business, get, get some education and not return to the poverty trap. Those shock therapies do not always work. You need to have the situation where it's almost recovering already. So in the lake, you first need to reduce the pollution. In the case of the poverty trap, the general economic situation needs to be such that it's actually possible to, to get back. So this is, this is one application is uh, restoration, recovery through shock therapy. Of course, you need to understand how the system works before you can know which shock uh, will be successful. The other uh, important uh, way we are now uh, trying to, to make this uh, useful for society is finding uh, universal indicators of resilience. We want to be able to measure how close a system is to a tipping point for collapse. It would be really interesting if we could do that for lakes, for rainforests before they collapse, for, um, for instance, the mood system. How close is someone to a tipping point for depression? Um, uh, so, and I'm saying it would be really interesting, but the cool thing is we actually found that there are universal indicators, universal, uh, at least quite generic indicators, that surprisingly work across very different systems. So it's, it's a miracle that you would find the same kind of signals in the brain or in a rainforest or in a financial market, but that has to do with very fundamental mathematical properties of system that's that are close to a, a tipping point. My first reaction 
as a scientist uh, would be, oh, that is so interesting. Let's study that, <laughs> see how it works. And, and actually, there are people th that, are, that are studying that and, and seeing how it's uh, trying to, to figure out how it works. Of course, uh, one element of that is that there is a kind of um, democratization of knowledge. You can find um, almost everything you want uh, on the internet. And that is really uh, beautiful and powerful, I think. On the other hand, um, it, it's very difficult for people to see the difference in quality of different information. So I'm not saying that a scientist is always right and a non-scientist uh, is not, but there is a, there is, um, a range of information uh, quality between uh, asking uh, somebody that has uh, perhaps never gone to school, never uh, left uh, the rainforest uh, about uh, certain, uh, answering certain questions, and somebody that has dedicated all, uh, all her life to studying this in university, standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think that uh, it, there is a lesson there uh, for society and, and for scientists. And, uh, um, uh, uh, um, it's a challenge to uh, try to find ways to allow um, the general audience to understand the, the difference in information uh, quality that there is. At the same time, um, I can also imagine that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the general public may feel that science knows a lot, but they know a lot about uh, very isolated facts. And uh, there is a, a lot of things that we don't study in science. And I think uh, science can uh, also benefit in that sense for, from um, interacting uh, more actively with the general public in uh, also seeking new questions to answer. Because one way of looking at science is that it is creating uh, insights, uh, like islands of insight, as, as they have been called, into a sea of ignorance. We know a lot, uh, uh, very well, very powerful way of focusing, but then it implies that we, it's difficult to see all the things we don't know around that. Um, I think uh, science can, uh, can benefit from, uh, from interaction with society in, in seeking important uh, questions to study and, and ways of looking at, uh, at things. So I think uh, we're, we're getting uh, closer to a, um, or we need to get, we need to get closer to a real um, interactive situation between science and, and society. I don't know if all young people, people should devote their lives to science because I think uh, we should be happy that there are good bakers and, uh, and chocolate makers and uh, road makers uh, and so too. Uh, I think, uh, I think um, people are born scientists. And usually usually uh, small children, if you talk to them, they think uh, already quite scientifically and they're very interested in, in everything. Um, which is basically the quality you need to have as a scientist. It, it's a privilege if you can make your profession out of that, uh, the, 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 the fascination and trying to figure out how, thing, how things uh, work. I, I don't see a problem of people not being interested in science, actually. I think the fascination, uh, the fascination is there. Um, I definitely got, got interested in it, I guess, from, mainly from my family. My, my family, my, my grandparents, their generation, they, they were doctors, uh, scientists. My grandfather was a, was a, was a chemist. Um, on the other hand, my parents, they were artists, they were musicians, and their brothers and sisters, this whole generation, they became artists. And I guess I got infected by, those, by both, both of them. 
those are both beautiful things to do in life and you can do them as a hobby, uh, especially the art. Science is more difficult to do as a hobby, although now you can, you have more resources with, with the internet and, and computers and measuring devices to even do it as a, as a hobby. Um, I think both music, both like art and science, they are, a, they are a way of living. You get just infected by them, you get fascinated, you can't stop, you want to know how things work. And it's, uh, it, it, it's a privilege if, if society pays you to do those uh, things. Uh, I, I, find, I find it very enriching and I don't, I don't think it's difficult at all to, uh, to infect <laughs> future generations with, with a love for, uh, for music and, and arts. I think it's, it just comes very natural to people. Yeah, there are so many frontiers of, of knowledge that are waiting for, for us to, uh, to, to pass. Uh, and uh, an obvious one is, of course, uh, uh, understanding well how the climate system works. And another one is understanding well how we ourselves work. How, how does our brain work? How do we get to um, believe one idea and not another idea? How do ideas spread um, in society? So I find the, the understanding of our, of our brain and, and the interaction between our brains as humans another real, really exciting uh, frontier of, uh, of knowledge. So I th for me, the most in interesting frontiers of knowledge are the ones that are related to the environment where we live, nature, the climate, uh, and the ones that, that are the questions about ourselves. How do we think? How, how do we get things done in, in society?